Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. I'm Lisa Friend, and I'm delighted to be your host this evening as we go on a long dreamed of trip of mine with a bevy of travel experts. I've dreamed of putting together a panel like this for a long time, so I'm so excited they're here tonight. So please allow me the pleasure to introduce our travel experts for the evening. From the independently and woman-owned travel agency, Elizabeth Holmes Travel, we have Yumiko Sato and Sherry Smith. Knowledgeable and straight shooting travel agents are a rare thing these days. And we're lucky to have these two with us tonight, answering your travel questions and busting some long held travel myths. Yumiko, Sherry, thank you for being here tonight. Thank, thank you, you for having us. us. Over on the train side, we have Rich Earl, a travel consultant and rail expert from here at Rick Steves. Thank you for being on Monday Night Travel again, Rich. Thanks for and, having me back, Lisa. And you're going to help us sort out our rail riding questions, including an update on rail passes for 2023. Yes. Super. And I am the automobile section this evening. I'm Lisa French, travel consultant here at Rick Steves and frequent driver in Europe. I've rented cars and driven in over a dozen European countries, so I'm here to share my firsthand knowledge and how I went from a white knuckle driver to a smooth, relaxed driver in Europe. So um, our format tonight will be a little bit different. We're going to take advantage of our travel agents and start off with some of the most frequently asked questions about flying. And then Rich and I will each give a short presentation about trains and automobiles, and then we will wrap up with that extended Q&A that I mentioned. So let's start with planes. Yumiko? Yeah. Sherry? Before we dive into it, you uh, work and own Elizabeth Holmes Travel. What is, what is the state of a travel agency these days? So we're we're looking out for our travelers. So the difference between a travel agent and a booking engine web, website is that we're here to help filter through all those options. There's so many options now. Filter through them based on your needs, your criteria, what's going to work well for you. Um, and then we're, we're kind of with you throughout the duration of your trip. So we're looking out for your reservations, whatever they might be. Um, clear through the time that you get home, sorting through schedule changes, um, seat number changes, uh, anything that might might go wrong. Would that include some strike action, perhaps? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> yes, as we know, um, airline strikes, work stoppages, um, mechanical problems, we do the best we can with those. Given advance notice, we're scrambling behind the scenes, looking for alternatives for our clients, making sure that we've got backup backup options booked for them whenever possible, and oftentimes tracking them down <laughs> on their Rick Steves tour <laughs> to let them know that they have a problem and that we fixed it. And here's what you're going to do. Yeah, Rick Steves Europe has always been a big proponent of using a travel agent, and we've been friends with Elizabeth Holmes Travel for over 20 years, so thank you for that. Okay, is there a special day to buy tickets for the best price? Um, I don't think so for international travel. In the 30 plus years that I've been booking airline tickets, I don't see that as a trend for international tickets. For domestic travel, yes. Um, Midweek when they're trying to muster up some sales, maybe on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, there can be some discounts. And then also more on the domestic side, you'll see that 4th of July sale or Memorial Day sale where you'll get hit in your inbox with some kind of a special or a short-term deal. Those things just don't apply or happen often with the international travel. Okay. Is there a best day of the week to travel on for the best price? Um, given everything the same, the availability so forth, normally Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday tend to be a little less than a uh, weekend. Weekend, sometimes the airlines do put the weekend surcharge on it. Sure. That makes sense. Okay. Let's see, there are huh, so many things that I see now when I'm online looking at um, looking at airfare. So there's 
non-refundable tickets, refundable tickets now that are more common than they than pre-COVID, and then light fares or basic economy or economy light. Can you help us sort that out? Yes. So in most cases with an international coach class airline ticket, there's usually three types of fares that most people will consider. One is um, the traditional fare that most of us are accustomed to. That is the ticket that you purchase that's non-refundable, um, but might allow you to make a change. Um, allow you to make a change if your plans need to be put on hold for whatever reason, or make a change if you're traveling and should have a problem or an illness, and you need to change those plans to come home earlier or later. Those are the fares we're accustomed to. And yes, they're non-refundable, but they're changeable. Some airlines in some markets have introduced refundable fares, and they're usually about a $200 upcharge, and they will allow you to cancel for any reason and get your money back. Um, now, a refundable fare, though, if you're traveling and you had to change your return, you still have to adhere to the penalties and possible additional um, charges to change your ticket to come home earlier or later. And then the third type you mentioned is the, the light fares is what most of us call them. And they are non-refundable. Once you buy it, you own it. You cannot cancel it, apply it towards another ticket no under change. any circumstances. And then also, if you should be traveling and again, have a problem, need to change your ticket, uh, can't come home as scheduled, um, you, you will have to buy a new one-way ticket home which could be very expensive. Are those the ones that won't even let you buy a seat assignment until 24 hours and there's no checked luggage, no carry on? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Those mm -hmm. are the ones I see. Yes. And those are the ones I avoid. Mm -hmm. we, we don't often recommend them for our clients. I get a, I get used to get questions a lot from consulting clients who would ask me, would a travel agent book a budget airline for me, like Ryanair and EasyJet? Mm -hmm. Do you guys book those kind of flights? We don't. Um, and with Ryanair and EasyJet, we don't have any access to solving a problem. And when we book something for our clients, we are we want to solve a problem. And if if I have no ability to do that, then we're not going to take on the liability for those tickets. Yeah, what it is is um, they're on their own. They don't have any agreement with any other airlines so that if there is any last minute strike or mechanical, Ryanair, EasyJet, they will tell you they don't cancel. They're just delaying by 72 hours. They will not put you on any different airlines, just themselves. So that for a lot of people, it is very restrictive and we cannot help, therefore, it's good to know. Yeah. Is that the same kind of thing for some of these budget airlines that I see for international now, like Norwegian? Is Norwegian Air still a thing? Um, I If they're flying, it's very limited. There might be a flight off the East Coast, but they didn't do well. Um, they were in Seattle for a while, San Francisco. They didn't do well. And the problem with a Norwegian airline Condor might be another mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. and some others that are starting to pop up is that similar to what Yumiko was saying about Ryanair and EasyJet, they don't partner with anybody. So if you're at your gateway airport and that airline has a mechanical problem, no one else is going to take their ticket. They, you can't be protected on another airline. Whereas if you have, for example, a flight on Delta we have a huge network with Delta to work within, but there's Air France and there's KLM, just like with United, there's Lufthansa. With Condor, and again, those individual budget airlines, um, if the plane doesn't go, you're probably not going either. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I'm still a big fan of you know, an easy jet flight one-off while I'm in Europe and I make sure and pay for every single 
bell and whistle, like, you know, the, the regular, um, fee is like $60. I'm like, but I'm going to pay for the seat assignment. I'm going to pay to check my luggage. I'm going to pay to be, get the VIP line. I'll do everything. And then my ticket will cost me $125, <laughs> but I'll, I'll feel better. About myself. <laughs> but for going over on the big flight, no, give me a nice Delta flight. Sorry. Anybody else? Um, okay. Let's see. What else do we have here? Um, when should I buy my tickets? This is a big question so people ask me that all the time. <laughs> when should I buy my ticket? <laughs> um, my question to them is usually, do you want to fly coach or an upper cabin? Because the answer is different. Um, I also, of course, want to know when they're looking to travel. If they're looking to travel what we know to be peak season, um, then you do have to plan in advance, especially if things like seats are important to you. Um, but the upper cabins, the premium economy and the business class have been very high demand this season as they were last season. And so if that is of interest to people, then my advice is sooner than later. Um, if it's a coach fair, um, if they're looking to travel, if I'm getting calls now for travel November and beyond, it might be worth waiting, but at this point, any time for peak travel, which is May through October, uh, six months is not an, an unreasonable time frame to think about purchasing your tickets. And again, our comment to our clients is normally, we know what a fair price is. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell somebody, let's see if it's a fair price. And if it, if it feels fair and we can get your seats, you might want to lock it down. If it feels expensive, we'll have that conversation. If it feels a little high, we'll check back with me in a month. So just to put you on the spot, um, <laughs> for this summer, what would what would a fair round trip, Seattle to London or Paris or Amsterdam, what would a fair, reasonable price be for that this summer? Well, if we're talking June 1st through July, that's a different answer than August 1st through the end of August. Oh, so tell me more about that. Please. Um, so June, June through really the middle of July is definitely the most peak time to travel and the airlines know it. And the fares are always high for those six, six ish weeks. Um, so if somebody were to call me now for a typical, say Seattle, um, Paris, London, yeah, yeah, a major city. I would be happy right now to find a fair $1,500 and under. Okay. Um, I'd be happy to find that price. Um, realistically, we've been seeing fares anywhere 14 to $2,200, just yeah. depending on the market and the availability and the dates. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, business class has been a lot higher. Yeah. The, I've, feel that overall, for those that have planned in advance, um, those that are planning, say, now for the fall, that the coach fairs are in line with what we have seen pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say last year, because last year was a one-off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. But pre-COVID, they're in line. The upper class cabins, the premium economy and the business, which Believe it or not, there's a big market for those seats. Um, they have been higher. I would say they're eight hundred to a thousand dollars higher this wow. year, and they're selling out. Well, people want to get back. Oh, okay, so you said those six weeks from about the beginning of June to the middle of July. What about that August? And I mean, I know why as a parent, I'm like, I want to get my kids out of school. I want to take five days to pack. And then I want to go on my trip um, before we get into all of the other summer activities. But right. so, so what about late July, August? You said that was a different bucket. Yeah, I would say I'm happy to find tickets. Again, I would say under $1,400. I think it's more realistic that you're going to find tickets in that Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen hundred dollar range for August. At this point, for June and July, again, I mean, there might be a good deal that somebody's found out there at the last minute, but sure. but you're going to be expecting to pay.
probably more between $15 and $2,000 for a ticket for June and July. It, well, we said a fair, you know, what's yeah. a fair mm-hmm. price? Yeah. You see yeah. And like so, that. you know, if you, and if you've got a family of four and it's important to you to lock those dates down on the calendar and make sure you're sitting next to your kids um, and keep moving on with your plans, then it's maybe you just bite the bullet. It's fair. Put that piece of your trip to bed and all the other fun stuff can start falling into place. Okay. All right. Um, so we touched on this already. Airlines and seat assignments. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Please tell me what you know. So an airline will never guarantee a specific seat assignment. Even you, if you pay for it. Mm-hmm, even if it's a purchase seat, they will guarantee you a like seat. So if you buy an aisle seat, they will guarantee you an aisle seat. It might not be 23C that you first clicked on, but they will guarantee you the same type of seat. Um, And I think that's important to touch on now uh, because the airlines are still trying to sort through how to most efficiently fly their aircraft. And so there's more changing of aircraft type um, after tickets are purchased than there was probably pre-COVID. So it doesn't happen a lot. But it does happen. But it does happen. And the airlines have every right to change your seat. <laughs> happened to me twice last year. You had a rough year last year. <laughs> I did, yeah. You probably don't even want to <laughs> get into that, but yeah. Um, okay. So we also touched on this, the difference in cabins, because I think when I fly now, I didn't get that basic economy ticket. That's super restrictive. I got a regular coach ticket, but then I see, oh, there's comfort plus or coach plus, and then there's premium select or business class. And then first, there's four classes on an airplane internationally sometimes. In How most, common is in, that? It's very common in many on many aircraft, there's four, maybe even five. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, but it's very typical to have four different crew categories of seating. One being coach, um, one being, a, we'll use Delta's terminology, economy comfort, which is a coach seat. It's the same seat. It just has more leg room. And then the next option would be a premium economy option that has many airlines are adopting the premium economy seats. Um, They've been very popular and that is a larger seat. It is slightly larger. It has better recline. It has more leg room. Different amenities. Different amenities, Mm -hmm. often some upgraded services, maybe a different check-in line. Um, sometimes additional uh, check luggage. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then there's business class, which, you know, those are the lie flat seats. Uh, if you want to sleep your way to Europe, um, lie flat seat. Um, it's hard to go back to yes. the economy <laughs> once you try yes. that. Yes. Be warned. <laughs> but once you upgrade, it is very hard to go back. So, um, I have had many clients decide that they want to go over in business class and home in premium economy, and they will get to Europe and I'll get that phone call and they'll be like, mm, what would it cost for us to come home in business class? <laughs> we changed our minds. So, um, and then the fifth one, if you're super lucky, er, there are still a handful of aircraft that have a true first class cabin. That's becoming more rare. But there are still some, especially it's, out of major gateways. Yeah, it's it's market driven. Seattle really isn't that first class market. But if you fly out of LA, JFK, mm. they are the first class market. Okay. Well, no, I don't want to ever <laughs> do that because I'll never be able to go back. I just convinced myself it's a ten hour flight, <laughs> and the price difference is. three hundred dollars an hour, and I'll just take a muscle relaxant and I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, I do I do like the comfort plus if it's if it's within my price range. I do like the extra three inches Just, of legroom. I 
did the premium select with the with the footrest and everything, and I, I didn't actually find it to be that much better. It wasn't worth what I would. I got a free upgrade because um, I had bought a Comfort Plus ticket. But yeah, some people do not particularly like the premium economy seat because the arm does not move. Yes. Yeah. So that it's fixed, and some people don't like it. No, yeah. I, did, I did not. I did not like that. Anyway, okay, let's see. Going on. Why don't I want to buy separate tickets? This was your Yumiko. You asked me to put this and went in here. Um, like, why don't I want to do like a British Air and then catch the? Why don't I want to get a British Air ticket from from here to London and then why don't I want to get that ninety nine dollar Ryanair ticket from London to Mallorca as connection? Yes, as a Ooh, connection. Ooh, no way. <laughs> oh no 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 no! no. <laughs> Yumiko says no 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 no. You are setting yourself up to failure. The reason being that um, once the the tickets you're protected only if your trip is on the one same ticket. If it's disjointed, let's say if you fly from here to London and British. And then Ryanair from, you know, Heathrow or, or Gatwick, wherever, to Mayoka. Ryan doesn't care if your flight was late. If you didn't show up there, you're no show because you're a disjointed ticket. If you book all the way through, let's say, British or at least on one ticket on the same airline, the same, mm -hmm. you know, one ticket, you're protected so that airline will get you because you bought the ticket and airlines are obligated to get you to your destination that on a ticket. Mm -hmm. If you have the disjointed, this right on here, I don't care. And especially I, if you're coming home. Yeah. So that would be even more of a situation if you're flying on a separate ticket from say, um, Frankfurt to London, even even if it was say a, a major carrier, even if it was say a Lufthansa ticket from Frankfurt to London, and then a British ticket from London to Seattle, it's very possible you'll have to go recheck in. It's mm -hmm. possible you have to go back through security, mm -hmm. and if you do not make the flight from London to Seattle, it is not that airline's British's obligation to help you. It is not their problem that you did not get there on time. And that will be a very expensive last minute yes. one way to get. So we, we do, we, if we do something like that for a client, um, we can't counsel them on what we're doing, <laughs> but we would build in an extensive layover. Like right. 10 hours. Right. Or even an overnight. Overnight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's let's wrap up with sort of 2023 trends and the nitty gritty. How early do I be at the airport? How long is enough for a connection? Do I have to go through customs every time I switch planes? Ooh. Tell me everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we're all excited to be traveling again. And I, I want to start by saying that the excitement, uh, the feedback I've had from clients that traveled in 2022 and they're starting to now travel in 2023. It's, I have never gotten as many thank you cards or um, just follow up thank yous um, because people are so excited to be going and people are having fabulous trips. Um, but there are things you can do to help mitigate some of the potential problems that, that are coming with people being short staffed and strikes. Um, and that is to be at the airport early. Um, a major airport, even Seattle, um, I'm telling my clients three to four hours early. It used to be three hours. I would say three to four, four hours early. Mm -hmm. um, some of the larger airports like in LA, a San Francisco, a Chicago, four hours early. Coming home from say a London, four hours early. Um, and, um, connection time. Same. Yeah. The connection times. Um, so, so the airlines often will just spit out a connection. You'll, oh. you'll pull it up online. 
on a web airline website and they'll give you a connection 55 minutes in Atlanta 55 yeah, minutes in Atlanta, Atlanta. or I, yeah I've oh, seen London. London yeah oh, no. and, and yeah yes we actually had one of those oh, um and if you can build in longer layovers for yourself I really would encourage it I know for us we're we're going beyond what just the airline throws out and we're searching for those longer connections. Um, I would much rather have a three hour connection than a one hour connection. I would much rather have um, in some of the larger airports um, knowing maybe I'm just sitting longer or I'm giving myself an ex where I know there's another flight so, for example, if you're connecting out of the Midwest through Chicago, I'm not going to book for my clients, if possible, the only the the last connecting flight. I want to I want to try to make sure there's a buffer in there in case something doesn't go as planned. And airlines has been having a lot more schedule changes, mm -hmm. so that what you thought was three hours could easily change to an hour and a half, just because they changed those short flights. That happened to my daughter last week. She had to fly to Belize with a school group. And thank God her first flight was delayed because the the line at SeaTac at 10 o'clock at night was an hour and a half long. Mm -hmm. And uh, but her flight had been delayed by an hour. So it, it all worked out. But she thought they all thought they were going to get like four and a half hours in Houston. And it ended up being closer to two and a half. And they were very happy they had that buffer. Yeah. Well, and with that said too, I would also make sure you're paying attention to your reservations. Just because you booked and bought a ticket does not mean that there's going to be a change between now and the time you go. And especially just like in the share mentioned about planning early, mm -hmm. more time you have, <laughs> more likely there will be multiple schedule changes that's yes. going to come your way. And you have to really watch them. And you know that, and again, we go back to the fact that you know, as an as an agent, we're looking out for our clients, and we're, you know, we're constant. Today's Monday. Monday is schedule change yep. drop day. I had twenty seven in my queue today. <laughs> wow. So I, I and, that, and that's an easy week. Yeah. That that's a pretty okay week. I've had somewhere I've had fifty records drop into my queue, and sometimes they're just five ten minutes here and there. Sometimes they're a whole day. So you really have to pay attention if an, if you're booking direct through the airlines and they send you an updated itinerary or something that says schedule change, you really have to pay attention um, to it and make sure that it's um, acceptable. Um, if it's not, you do have the ability to contact an airline and have a discussion about something not being acceptable. Um, but it's all computer generated. And so they just they just spit something out where, you know, we do take the time and we go through each one and, and I'll look and say, no, this isn't going to work. And we're behind the scenes trying to find other solutions, but pay attention to the schedule changes. And then finally, I would just say, um, have patience <laughs> and have grace because we're all human beings out there. Yep. Thank you, ladies. We will have more questions for you at the end of the show, but that was very illuminating. Um, so now we're going to talk about when do you need to rent a car? When do you need to take a train? And before I turn it over to Rich, I think he will agree with me. Basically, if you're going from city to city in Europe, train all the way. You really only need a rental car for those off the beaten path places that are not serviced well by trains or buses. So there are times when both will be the right answer for you. And I was going to add regarding some flights, especially budget flights. I've flown a lot of those budget airlines. And for me, people will often ask me, like in, in consulting appointments, clients will say, should I fly between Stockholm and Copenhagen or should I take the train? And for me, I, I would prefer to always take the train because I'm tall. So it's more comfortable for me. But when I see a train ride being about six hours or more, I will start looking at a flight. And especially because there are some budget airlines that are very cheap and you can fly very inexpensively. So I tend to do a combination of, the, of both of those things, but I prefer to take trains. Yeah, my rule of thumb is if it's six hours or under and direct the train always. If it's 
over six hours or you're starting to have like four or five connections and there's a direct flight, then you look at that. Right. Okay, so we are going to now go to Rich's um, PowerPoint presentation. So let me slide that over to you, my friend. So one of the first stops that you could go if you're thinking about traveling by train, people always ask the question, do I need a rail pass? Do I need individual tickets? Our website at rickskis.com is packed with information. So we have quite a bit of information to help you decide if you need a rail pass or not. We have these wonderful point-to-point -point maps on our website that you can look at to see, you know, I'm going to take a train between Frankfurt and Paris. How much does that cost? How long does it take? This point-to-point -point map, for instance, will show the first number is the cost of a one-way second-class ticket in U.S. dollars. It's rounded up to an estimated price. And the second number is the hours that it would take. So you can use this map to kind of plot your trip and see if a rail pass is worth it for you. We also have more detailed maps by country. So for instance, this is our Switzerland on our Switzerland rail pass page. We have these maps that show the average cost of a one-way ticket between different destinations. So you can use that to add up your itinerary as well. One of the best websites for figuring out how do I get from point A to point B? Is there a train? How many trains? Is it direct? Is the German railway website, which is called the Deutsche Bahn. They have an app you can download on your smartphone. It will tell you train schedules anywhere in Europe. Um, it won't give you prices or you can't buy tickets for trains that don't start or end in Germany or within Germany. Also Switzerland and Austria, but it would show you a train schedule all the way from Stockholm, Sweden to Lisbon, Portugal, if that's what you wanted. I do not. <laughs> <laughs> that's hours. a long train ride. But when you're looking at the Deutsche Bahn site, for instance, you put a search in, this will show us generally three or four schedules. And you can see here certain things. So it'll have this, the station in Paris. And you don't have to know the name of the station. You can just put in Paris. And the, the Deutsche Bahn will pick the right station for you. It will show you the length of the trip and then the change column here. If it's direct, it's going to be zero. If it has one, it has a, a train change somewhere. This is a highlight showing you where your change trains. In this case, it's showing you also the train numbers and whether this train needs a reservation or not, subject to compulsory reservation. Then there's lots of different kinds of trains in Europe. So people often say, which train should I take? It doesn't matter sometimes that you don't have an, an option. It's whatever train is on that route. But every country has their version of the high-speed trains. This is one of the Italian um, Freccia trains. Then you have more regional trains. This is a Dutch sprinter train. And then you have the scenic trains, like in Switzerland. The scenic trains have these panorama cars. People always ask, how much glass is that? <laughs> they, they do have more bigger glass windows than a normal train. And then the other question I often get is, what's the difference between first and second class? So this is a second class train in, in Spain on the high-speed Ave train. It's generally two seats across each side with an aisle. You can see there's storage space above your seats for your bags. A first class seat is going to be the seats are a little bigger and it's generally two seats, an aisle and one seat. And That's, you can. Sorry, I'm sorry for interrupting. As a solo traveler, I love first class because I get an aisle and a window all together. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And you can see there's plenty of storage space up here. Different countries, different trains have different amounts of storage space, but you can put a pretty big size bag up here. Um, more regional trains are going to be a little more simple. So you can see uh, like a regional train is not going to have first or second class. It's just going to have second class. And it's like getting on a bus. There's no assigned seats. You just buy your ticket and get on. Um, almost every train has a luggage storage compartment at the end. So you can put a bigger bag here. People are always kind of worried. Is someone going to steal my bag? Get that question a lot. You should always assume that there's a thief on every train. Mm -hmm. But thieves are looking to steal small things like purses and laptops. They're not going to grab a big 22 inch bag usually. So for the most part, I leave my big bag here at the end of the train car always. I've never had an issue. Doesn't mean it couldn't happen, but I think it's relatively safe. They all have bathrooms on them. This is a typical train bathroom. And then sleeping compartments. There are a lot of overnight trains and overnight trains have had a big comeback the last couple of years. The Austrian railways now runs most of them. This is a typical um, overnight trains will have different kinds of compartments. Um, which they call couchettes or sleeper cars. They'll either be a four-person couchette, which is this one, a six-person, which would have another bunk up at the top here. Too cramped for me. I don't want a six-person <laughs> couchette. 
And then you have the first class, which would be, you can see up here um, on the left-hand side, this would fold down to be another bunk if there were two people in here. If you had this as a private room for yourself, this would be up and you would just have a bed and then usually a little area to store your bag. Um, also, the sleeper cars are configured a little differently. They'll have a hallway down here with all these little compartments and then a window on the side. And then the bathroom is going to be at the end of the hallway. Dining on the trains, there are dining compartments. Uh, this is the dining compartment on one of the Swiss Panorama trains. Other trains, there may, may be just a guy who comes through with a little cart offering snacks, coffee, drinks. And then, of course, you have the conductor who's going to come through and check your ticket. Sometimes on your train, you'll never see the conductor. It depends how long your train ride is. But usually they're going to come through. They're going to look at your ticket or your rail pass, stamp it, make sure you're in the right seat if you have a seat assignment. And then the train stations themselves. These can be quite large, big, modern train stations or ornate, very decorative, old style stations. This is the Atocha in Madrid. It's a pretty nice train station. Inside has a botanical garden. Then you'll also see down here, it's kind of hard to see, but you'll see restaurants and shops. Um, there's always a ticket window where you can go buy a ticket in person, um, or if you have a rail pass and you need it validated, if it's the old style of rail, paper rail pass, they still need to be validated. Um, they also have automated ticket machines, which work just like an ATM. They have English instructions, French instructions, German instructions. You can pay with a debit card, credit card. And then up here, you'll also see the departures board. So people will often say, well, I don't speak Spanish. How am I going to figure that out? If you look here, it'll say salidas in Spanish, but then right next to it, departures in English. And then you'll see the departure time, where the train is going to. This is the train number, which will be printed on your ticket, similar to a flight number, and then the platform number. When you're looking at the screen, this is in the English version of one. It's very simple to use. Um, so you, this is just a, a close-up of one of those screens. And then again, one of the, this is an Italian departure board. And in some countries, especially Italy, if it's a regional train ticket, um, you will have to stamp it before you get on the train. Um, if it's a high-speed train, those are all reservation trains. When you buy a ticket, it's for a specific date and time, and you have an assigned seat. If it's a regional train, it's just for that day. You can take any other regional train that same day, but you have to stick it in this little machine, which you will see on the train platform, and that stamps the date and time and validates it. If you don't do that, you can get a big, fat fine. Um, some trains will have a security um, line. This is the Ave line in Madrid. Similar to an airport, you have to put your bag through a little scanner. And then when you go down to the platform, this is showing you the platform, platform six, with the train departure time, its destination, and the train number. The side of the train will also have the train number on it and the train um, car number and where it's going. Uh, the tickets are going to be, people will often say, well, how do I know you know, how to read my ticket. So this has the date on it, where you're starting and going to. This, in this case, you're starting in Bologna, going to Milan. This is the train number, train 9810, car number five, seat number 16, window seat. And the price of the ticket, and then it's an adult child, et cetera. There's lots of different kinds of tickets. This is one purchased online. I bought online and then printed out um, at home and brought it with me. They all have these little QR codes now where the conductor will scan it. And then this is a ticket on my phone. You can buy almost every major country has their own rail system and their own apps, and you can buy a train ticket. I would say the most useful ones that I find are the Italian, Train Italia app. Um, in England, train line or national rail. And um, some countries, it's a little less user-friendly than others. I find the French railway website, the Spanish railway website are not very user-friendly and often, in the case of Spain, will not accept a lot of American credit cards. Mm -hmm. So I use the train line app for France and Spain and England. And on my tours, when I do tours, I do tours in Spain and Italy. I always have my tour members download the train load app on their phone. If they want to take a day trip to Toledo or Segovia, they can buy them right on the phone in the hotel when they have Wi-Fi, and then they have the tickets right here on their phone. Your rail passes have changed a lot in the last couple of years, and we get a lot of questions about these. This is the old style rail pass, how they used to be. You would have a paper pass about the size of an airline ticket, and you would have these little boxes where you would fill in the date, would have your name printed on it, the countries that it's going to. 
Um, this is a close-up of one of a URL select pass. This doesn't exist anymore, but this is from a few years ago. So you can see here where it becomes valid. There's a validation period, meaning it's good for, in this case, eight days and two months. Before you used it, you had to validate it. They would put the day, month, and year that it starts and ends. And then these little eight boxes are your travel days, which you fill out when you get on the train as your passport number, and then it becomes validated at the station before you go. Nowadays, they're all electronic. So the URL passes have changed a lot and they're quite confusing to a lot of people. I would say if you're at all not a tech savvy person, avoid buying a URL pass because they're not as good of a value as they used to be either. They also come with a lot of um, reservation fees and some countries limit the seats available for rail passes. Countries like France and Spain only have a certain number of seats for rail passes and you still have to book a reservation and pay an extra fee. That can be anywhere from 10 euros up to 40 euros or even higher on like the Eurostar. So often I would say for most people, there are still some rail passes that are a good value. When clients used to come set an appointment with me sometimes just to figure out which rail pass to buy. And if it was Germany, I'd say a rail pass is still pretty good value. Mm -hmm. You don't have to reserve most of the trains. Switzerland, the same, um, the UK. If you're doing a lot of long distance train travel over multiple countries, then a URL pass can still be a good value, but you really have to do the math and figure out if it's worth it for you. Um, on our website where we sell the rail passes, we do also sell individual tickets. So you can buy a ticket. I think it's a little a question people often would ask me is, is it where's the best place to buy a ticket? You know, if I'm going to be in Germany, should I buy it? And I'm going to buy a ticket from Berlin to Frankfurt. Should I buy it here through Rick Steves or should I buy it through the German railway website? I think it's almost always better to buy it directly through the seller. Um, if you're doing multiple tickets over different countries, I think buying it through Rail Europe or you know, where our website is an agent of Rail Europe or URL.com, you're getting a one-stop shopping. You're buying all your tickets in one space, especially for Eastern European trains. Some of their websites can be a little not very user-friendly. Um, if you were just taking a few trains in Germany, I would buy them through the German railway site. In Spain, I'd buy them through the train line site. Thank you, Rich. Lisa, it's next to you. Okay, well, renting a car. The first thing I have to say is size matters. So you got to figure out what kind of <laughs> car you want. Um, this is a this is a compact or a subcompact car, and I just saw this parking job, and I had to take a picture. This would be great if I was traveling by myself. Um, but if I have anybody else with me, basically you want to get the biggest car that will fit everybody who needs to be in the seats and their luggage and not a bit bigger. So um, you want to keep that in mind. It's good for gas, um, you know, gas costs, for parking, for just driving on narrow streets. Um, and it's almost always going to be a manual, a stick shift. If you get an automatic, it's going to cost you 40 or 50% more. Um, that can be a nice luxury for people, um, especially in Great Britain or Ireland. Uh, when I rented a car the year before last in Italy, I found out that it had um, two things that I wasn't used to. One, it had hill assist. So I'm in Orvieto in Italy and I'm at the stop sign at the top of a hill and you know, like I'm sweating and terrified because it's been a while since I drove a stick and I'm gonna have to... <laughs> Right. Um, no, it actually wouldn't let me back up, but it was fine. It had an automatic braking system. So I just went and whew, smooth sailing. So that made me a more relaxed driver. And the other thing that I wasn't prepared for is a lot of European cars, a lot of European rental cars will now have um, a thing where it stops. When you come to a stoplight, the car just turns itself off to save fuel. And if you're not prepared for that, you can get kind of freaked out. So no, don't worry. When you step on the gas or release the clutch, it will start up again. So that's nice. And when you are traveling, um, the, the luggage is important. You really do need to understand that trunks are not as big as what we are used to. Soft-sided luggage can be a big boon. Mostly you're going to be looking at cars for four people maximum, unless you have little ones. We squeezed six people into this van, but um, nobody was real happy about it. 
Um, you can rent vans, but I have found them to be, I, I think you guys will agree that a, you can almost always rent two small yes. cars <laughs> cheaper than you yeah. can rent a van in Europe. So keep that in mind. I love to <clears throat> um, call Auto Europe. They're a US-based consolidator and rent from them. Um, I probably imagine you could also call your handy dandy travel agent and um, they would help you with that with, as part of your package. Um, I really like Avis when I'm over in Europe. I've rented from Hertz. They have a big network. Um, Sixt, S-I-X-T, is a big German rental car company that a lot of us haven't heard of, but it's totally reputable. And, and then Europe Car is a big player over there as well. And where to pick up a car. There is usually a surcharge to picking a car up at an airport. Pay it. It is <laughs> worth it. You don't want to have to um, pick up your car in the middle of the city and deal with all of that traffic um, getting out. So I like an airport pickup and drop off. Also, um, I appreciate the sweet access to the freeway. And then there's another place I'll pick up a car, and that is at a train station. So not always, not all train stations, but especially in France, there are big TGV high speed rail stations that are actually outside of the city. So it's almost like mm -hmm. picking one up at an airport. So this is this space age train station is actually in Avignon in France, outside of the city center. And we dropped off our car and took a high speed train to Paris and it worked out so beautifully. Um, <laughs> I would never advise someone to drop off a car um, at a train station inside the city. I've almost become divorced a couple of times because of this. <laughs> but if it's your only option, then use like Google Earth and Street View and figure out exactly where you need to drop that car off because it's not well marked. And sometimes it's a parking garage and sometimes it's just one or two parking spots outside behind the train station. So you really want to know exactly where you're going to drop that off and give yourself plenty of time because that's the, the other stressor is if you're trying to catch a train mm -hmm. and drop off your rental car, that's not going to, not going to go very well. But again, you want to do that outside of the city. So you don't have to go through a 12 lane traffic circle in oh. Paris. <laughs> <laughs> Here is a close-up of a car. So it's a stick shift. Obviously, this is Great Britain or Ireland where they drive on the opposite side of the road, not the right or the wrong side, just the mm -hmm. opposite side yeah. of, the, of the road that we do. Um, but you'll see that everything else looks normal. The, the clutch, the brake, the gas pedal are all in the same order. They're just on the other side of the car. Um, before you drive off, no matter what country you're in, you want to take time to get to know your car. <laughs> because if you think about it, like when I drive, I drive my car, I drive my car, I drive my car. And then I have to drive my husband's car. Well, his blinkers in the wrong place, his windshield wipers are opposite. So you get used to driving your car. So you really want to take that time to get to know your rental car that you're going to be in for the next, you know, week or so. Um, you want to figure out, can you get it in all the gears, especially reverse? Sometimes <laughs> eventually, one. yeah, right? <laughs> there's a little ring that you have to lift up to put it in um, in reverse, or there's a button or something. So you want to make sure you can get it in all the gears, how to open the trunk, how to open the gas cap, if it locks. Um, what side is the gas on? What side is the what gas on? What kind of on? gas? <laughs> yes, okay, you're... you're <laughs> Don't don't pick my raisins from my cake, <laughs> as my German teacher used to say. Um, and you want to make sure it has safety features. So in France, you're legally required to carry a breathalyzer with you. Um, what? Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yes, it's a law in France. You're supposed to have a breathalyzer with you. So the rental cars are supposed to come with one or you can buy one at the counter. Yeah. Wow. And you're also supposed to have a high visibility safety vest. So you're supposed to have like a bright yellow vest if you have to do like change your tire or anything. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Teaching all the stuff here. Um, gas. So yeah, we talked about um, gassing up your car or diesel. Um, but we make sort of these palaces 
in America out of gas stations. And, and I've had people on tour be like, there are no gas stations anywhere in the sound. Like we just drove by one, but they're little, they're not obvious. They don't stick out. So people don't always see them. So, um, and you want to, you want to know what kind of fuel you want. I have a rule in my family that we buy fuel during the day, during business hours. Because even though here I can go to AM, PM at nine o'clock at night and put in my card and never see a human being and do my gas and leave. If something doesn't go right with your fueling and your card doesn't work, you could be at a French gas station at eight o'clock at night going up to French strangers saying, will you please put gas in my car and I'll give you cash because there's nobody around. So that is why there's a rule in my family now that we buy gas during business hours when there's a person at the station. So smart. Yeah. Um, navigation. So navigation yeah. is pretty important. I'm a big fan still of a paper map. You are not guaranteed that your car rental agency will supply you with one. So you should bring one from home. I like atlases um, if I'm traveling because they're easier. They're heavier, unfortunately, but they're easier to read because they're more like a big book than unfolding this huge um, scrap of paper. But a paper map is at least something that you should consider. The, the thing I want you to understand is that Europeans don't um, give directions by compass points like we do in the U.S. They do it by direction. So if you look at this picture, you can see that the N95, the national road, either goes in the direction of Cork or the direction of Ross Lair. So you're going to need to know what are the large cities at the end of your destination? What's What are you going to be coming along along the way? So you need to have some familiarity with that. Um, the other thing that's a rule in my family is every time you come to a roundabout, you get a free 360 degree <laughs> spin. It doesn't matter. We've got time enough. We'll go all the way around, check out all our options, and then and then wing wake. And those other people, they don't know that we went all the way. <laughs> um, I took this picture uh, yesterday, and it made me realize that I needed to dust my car. But <laughs> a car phone holder is hugely important, especially if you're traveling by yourself. You really need to be able to have your phone somewhere you can see it so it's not just sort of laying down on the seat next to you. So you want to bring a, a phone holder from, from home and you want to bring a car charger and a spare battery. Why? Because once it happened to me that the the cord didn't work in my rental car and navigation apps suck up a lot of battery life. So you don't want to hear the full story of when I got that flat tire in England and had to go to the bar and ask them to charge my phone while we waited for the man to come um, and fix had my I, I didn't, but I really wanted one because <laughs> the drink driving is so strict in um, basically anywhere in Europe that I won't even have maybe a half a glass, but <laughs> that's, that's it. Um, the other mistake that I've made that I want to make sure that you don't make is know uh, what the daylight is going to be like when you go to pick up your car. Um, so on the plus side, I took this picture uh, at a castle in Scotland at 9.58 p.m. in June. No problem. I pulled into my B&B late. There'd been a flight delay. I pulled in right at 11.30 at night when it was just starting to get dark. So that was a big plus. Unfortunately, I also once booked a car to pick up at 6 p.m. in Pisa in November, not really thinking that I was going to be driving the entire time in the dark. So just <clears throat> keep that in mind. And then the signs, all of the stop signs in Europe say stop, no matter what the local language is. So that works really well. You're going to want to familiarize yourself with these um, my favorites are up at the top, the pass, the no passing and the end of the no passing zone. And a lot of times people ask me, well, I'm nervous about driving in Europe because I don't speak the language. It doesn't really matter because the signs are universal. They're pictograms. They're made to they're made for easy understanding. So if you familiarize yourself with them, you'll be in good shape. Um, also, 
it doesn't matter if you're in France and you know the the town is uh, Aix en Provence, right? It doesn't matter if in your head you say we're going to that Axe place, <laughs> that Axe <Axe-Provence> province <laughs> place, because you just need to know that when you see the sign, it says the same thing that's in your head, and nobody cares if you can pronounce it correctly. So <laughs> you want to familiarize yourself with those signs. And then Uh, tolls. Tolls are really important. You're going to run into them um, in most countries in Europe, not not Germany necessarily, um, but a lot of other ones, and especially Spain, Portugal, Mm -hmm. Italy, France. You're going to see these. And you can see that on the left-hand side, it says Reservata Clienti Telepass. So you don't have a telepass. That's not you. Do you have a card? Yes. Do you have a card? And I don't know if you guys can see this at home, but underneath it says via card and there's all the little like Visa MasterCard. And then over to the right, you can't see it, but it's this white sign here. That one has the picture of the coins and the dollar bills or the paper money. I always like that one because usually you can pay with card or you can pay with cash. And if you've ever had to have your card not work and have to get out and ask four French cars to back up so that you can back up. Mm-hmm. You don't want to have that happen. So, which actually didn't happen to me, but it happened to some friends we were traveling with. So, <clears throat> and in Europe, there are speed cameras. They're so polite that they let you know <laughs> that there is a speed camera, but it is very easy to get a ticket. They'll take a picture of your license. They'll send it to your Um, car rental agency and either they will deduct it from your credit card or they will provide your address and I'm sorry that this is a little blurry I was going really fast (laughs) thank you (laughs) parking you're going to want to do some parking Um, I was reading the Rick Steves uh, travel article on car rental and it said parking you know you're going to pay 30 to 50 dollars a day in big cities i'm like you should never be parking in a big city you should be turning in your car and not worrying about it but when you're in these little places you will find free parking but you're also going to go visit these little towns and you need to pay attention to what the signs say and this is when google translate will be your best friend figure out what countries you're going to the language they speak and download those languages to your phone so that you can put up your phone and take a picture and it will translate the sign so that you know what it says in English. So that'll be your best friend. And this is very important. Yumiko's <laughs> like, oh yes, ZTL, Zona Trafico Limitato. So these are signs that you see specifically in Italy. They've made a lot of areas uh, pedestrian only. So if you see this sign, do not go past this sign. Pull over safely and stop and figure out why you are trying to go into an area where you are not allowed to, because there's probably a camera mm-hmm. that will take a picture of your license plate and give you a big fat ticket. And if you get lost and you go past it two or three times, <laughs> it doesn't know you did it once. It'll rack it up every single time you'll pay more and more. So <clears throat> this one is a little bit more of a real life example. And I wanted to point out that this says Zona Trafico Limitato, and then the sign below says 20 to 8. They're using the 24-hour clock, so this is 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., and it says Eceto Residenti Autorizzati, which means roughly there's an exception for residents who are authorized, plus disabled people and fire people and police people and motorcycles. But you might be authorized if you have agreed upon that with your hotelier Mm -hmm. ahead of time. So there will be times where you might drive into this, but you just need to know that you have the the right to do that. And then I love driving in Europe. I especially, I actually like driving in Scotland um, as far as the other side of the road. Scotland is my favorite because there's not a lot of traffic and the roads are wide. And then on the continent, France is my favorite country to drive in because it feels kind of the most like driving here. Mm -hmm. Um, But I hope that you have the sweet freedom of life on the road when you are in Europe. So that is the end of our formal presentation. What we do now before Gabe stops by and gives us some questions is I wanted to give you guys a word from our sponsor. So our sponsor today is obviously ricksteves.com. 
but we are featuring our tours on sale. So we have a handful of tours that have some seats left, mostly in June and July, and they're anywhere from $300 to $500 off. And most of these tours just have three or four or five seats left. So keep that in mind. But if you want to save a little bit of money, we have some tours on sale. So I see that there are some questions coming. <laughs> Thank you, Gabe. It's like, oh, who got the Oscar? <laughs> Fantastic. The winner is. Okay. And also, Gabe has excellent handwriting. So we did have a few people who uh, sent us some questions ahead of time. So I'm going to ask this is for you, Rich. Will you cover how to get around on the Italian rail system? Well, we did. But she says, this is Lovada. She says, I'm trying to get from Rome to Sorrento. I am puzzled. Rome to Sorrento is one where it's a little, not tricky, but there's a couple different ways to do it because there's not a direct train. So you take a high-speed train, one of the Italian Breccia trains, between Rome and Naples, and those go every about half an hour. It takes 70 minutes, cost about 50 bucks. So when you buy one of those high-speed Italian freches, you're buying a reserved seat at a particular day and time. So if you book it ahead, you can get it cheaper. They're just going to be non-refundable, non-exchangeable, but you won't have a problem usually buying it the day of or the day before the station. You probably won't get those cheap ticket prices, but you're going to have more flexibility. Once you get to Naples, the main station in Naples is Napoli Centrale, and underneath the Napoli Centrale is the Garibaldi station. And that's where you catch the little local Circumvesuviana train, which runs between Naples and Sorrento every half an hour. And that's not a train that you can buy ahead. You just buy it there. It's almost like buying a bus ticket in your home city. You just get on and go. Now, that train can be crowded and hot um, because it doesn't have reserved seating. You can sometimes maybe have to stand. That also takes about 70 minutes to get between Naples and um, Sorrento. It's the same train that you would take to go to Pompeii or Herculaneum as well. There's a, a newer train, just, just a few years old, called the Campania Express, which does that same route. They're a little nicer air conditioned, but they only run maybe four or five, six times a day. Um, so you can look at the schedules online. If you were to just Google Campania Express, you would see it. Um, you can also take a boat between Naples and Sorrento. You would just take a taxi then from the train station down to the port and you would buy a ticket on the next available boat. You wouldn't need to buy it ahead. Those go about once every two hours. In high season. In high season, yes. Yeah. Not during the winter time. Yeah. Thank you. All right, ladies. Um, Donna says, I just turned 76. And when researching car rentals in Great Britain, one of the first questions is, are you over 75 years old? I assume there will be a surcharge and not a no to renting me a car. Are there rental agencies that do not discriminate when renting cars to over 75 year old people? I have definitely rented cars to people over 75. Um, it's It would just be something we would want to know up front and it would be something we need to make sure we ask the supplier. Mm -hmm. But I I don't feel it's off the table to rent a car at that age. And that's one nice thing about like Auto Europe because mm -hmm. they know all the companies so that you tell them when you want to pick up, they will ask you what's the driver's age. Mm -hmm. So they only will tell you these are the companies that are available in that market so that kind of they will do the research and, you know, looking at free. Yeah. And there might be a surcharge, but you can yeah. still get it done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. It's quite exciting. <laughs> Oh, Peggy, God bless you. What a great question. Peggy wants to know, when do you need an international driver's license? Um, I will answer this one since uh, this has come up many times. Um, so when do you need an international driver's license? Well, it depends on who you ask. The, the rental car company like Auto Europe will say you need an international driver's license when you go to actually rent your car, they don't care about your international driver's license. They want to see your real driver's license. Um, but an international driver's license, which you can get at AAA, costs about $25. 
it's basically a certified translation of your driver's license so that that nice police officer who's pulled you over um, doesn't isn't expected to speak English. So it has a translation of your license. But yes, I have rented a car in Italy specifically without an international driver's license. And I was nervous, but I didn't need it to rent the car. Do you guys? On the other hand, last year we had a client in Italy did not have travel uh, international driver's license and they said mm -mm, we, you can't rent it they were denied the they were denied wow yeah okay. and i'm finding um as we're booking more cars um for 2023 that more places are require requiring mm -hmm. an international driver's license um my advice to my clients would be just to get one just get it it's, yeah it's it's yeah only $25, $30. It's just peace of mind. Yeah, yeah. You should get one. I didn't go to Italy on purpose with that one. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and it's good for a year. So if yeah. you were going to go back, mm -hmm. you could use it again. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you, Peggy. Um, Mary wants to know any advice for handicapped travelers needing assistance in the airport? Um, ask for it. Um, so when we, if if we're alerted that somebody needs maybe a little extra assistance, usually it's it's a wheelchair assistance. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be pre-noted in the reservation. And um, normally what I recommend is that whoever you're traveling with, go secure the wheelchair. And, and it's usually not a problem, but I never have a hundred percent faith in the air. I'm yeah. sorry. You need to, um, you put in a reservation, not even just a wheelchair. We normally put how much assistance you need. Mm -hmm. We normally be able to tell them this person cannot walk or this person is okay going up and down the stairs. We can specify how much assistance you may need. But again, we're at the mercy of airlines actually do it. But with that said, I I do think that that um, as long as it's prearranged, it's usually um, and once you you get the first flight um, under your belt, um, it does tend to go pretty smoothly, mm -hmm. and they'll be they'll be waiting at the in the jetway, um, and if somebody has. Um, a tight connection <laughs> and you don't walk necessarily quickly, um, it can be a really good resource and um, they'll whisk you right to where you need to be. So no, I would say to never hesitate to ask for that service. And, um, you know, from an agent perspective, it's a very easy uh, process for us to request that. So if people are traveling and they didn't book through a travel agency, they would just mm -hmm. contact the airline directly or the mm -hmm. airport? Airline. 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 Okay. Great. <laughs> uh, Richard says, how long does it take to go through customs and when do you have to do it if you have a layover? It depends. So that let's say that... Um, you're leaving, oh, this is Seattle. So let's say you're leaving Seattle and you're making a connection, uh, let's say in Paris, but your actual destination is Rome. You do not clear a custom until you get to Rome. You're not going to do that over in, um, uh, in, in, in Paris because you just do, but you do go through the passport control. You go through the passport control and so, it's not the customer's time you want to kind of think about. It's queuing up for the passport stamping. Yeah. So a lot of people don't understand the difference between customs and passport con control. Um, customs is, you know, for paying duty on things for shopping. But passport control is when you enter mm -hmm. the Schengen zone. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get off the airplane in your first port uh, in Europe in the Schengen zone, Paris mm -hmm. or Amsterdam. And you're going to go through passport control then, and then your onward flight to Rome or right. what have you, you're just going to get off the airplane. And yes, you're going to go through the doors and say, yes, I have something to declare or no, I don't have anything to declare. Um, but that's the customs is there's yeah. usually not even a line, but passport control in Amsterdam last year, it was taking a solid hour, hour and a half. Yeah. I think you guys probably mm -hmm. heard that. Yeah. So you don't want to dilly dally. I would allow an hour for going through passport control. Mm -hmm most European airports. And you don't pick up 
uh, luggage until you get this, the your final destination. So that you go through the passport control, let's say in Amsterdam and Paris, but you do not pick up the luggage. You only pick up your luggage when you get to Rome and then you go through the customs. Mm -hmm. Green light or red light. That's all it is. <laughs> yeah. The, no, most of the time there's no dog sniffing either. But the other thing I would just add to that is that when you choose your flight home, that's something to think about with customs also. If you're, let's, we'll, we'll use Seattle because that's where we're at. Let's say you're flying from Rome and you're going to connect through Amsterdam to Seattle. You're going to clear your customs and immigration in Seattle. So you're here. You don't have an onward flight. Um, whereas if you were going to connect, say, through JFK or Chicago, you have to clear customs in your first entry point to the United States. If your flight comes in late and you have a connection, it doesn't matter. You have to go through customs. So, um, again, for somebody that's concerned about a little anxiety about flying or, again, mitigating some of the problems, I tend to like to use some of the more of the polar route flights where people are actually clearing customs immigration in their final destination. I would much rather be stranded in Amsterdam than Newark. <laughs> That's yep. just a personal preference. Mm -hmm. um, Don wants to know, this is an interesting question. Don wants to know, what are best practices when purchasing an open-ended return ticket? Is that still even possible? No, okay. No. I didn't think so. And a lot, of, a lot of the time, if you only have one way, you may not be able to enter Europe. Oh, yes. If you don't have a, a ticket home, they don't really want you to land in yep. their country. Yep. Unless you have like some sort of residency permit, something that allows you to stay longer. They may not even. Eh. Nope. Yeah. They want to make sure you don't get stranded there. That's why your passport should have six months of validity mm -hmm. in it when you are when you're leaving Europe. Ah, here's a good question, Scott. Has Brexit influenced how people travel between the UK and mainland Europe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think so? Yeah. Huh. Because before it was part of the EU, so you could do your customs and, and be in the Schengen zone, or actually they weren't part of the Schengen no, zone. No, they weren't. You yeah, could they do weren't. your passport control, and then you didn't have to do it when you got off, didn't you? Uh, UK, Ireland were not... And never was a part of Schengen. Right. So that if you travel in between, let's say, from Rome to London, you go through the passport control, you go through, um, you get stamped both ways. You have the exit stamp in Rome and you have the entry stamp in UK and then the customers in UK. So that hasn't changed. Hmm. I know what has changed because I, yes, you're correct, um, obviously. But what has changed is now the English people have to wait uh -huh. in line uh, yeah. mm -hmm. that they didn't have to wait in line. So they clog up uh, the, yeah. the passport yeah. control mm -hmm. line. Yeah. That's the, because no, it's definitely a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're yes. not EU passport. Anymore. Yes, yep. that's what it is. Yep. Right. Thank you. Um, let's see. Oh, Peter wants to know, is it difficult to drive on the left side of the road in Great Britain? <sighs> It's not a walk in the park, but it's it's well for me it's easy because I learn in Japan. <laughs> oh, do they drive on the opposite side of the road in Japan? We learn everything from the UK. Oh, okay. okay. So um the what I normally like, you know, my husband who doesn't do that. Um I always tell people driving in UK from here is watch out your left because you tend to try to drive in relation to where your position is in the road. Mm. So that you try to keep veering to the left a lot more without noticing it. Mm. And then I remember like yelling like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I did when I got that flat tire, I hit a curve. Yeah. Um, the other thing I told you some of my rules for driving and my family thinks this is funny, but in, in England or Ireland or, or Scotland or Wales, um, if I'm coming to a, to a left turn specifically or any, any intersection, you want to say, I say it out loud because we mm -hmm. do so much driving just 
sort of subconsciously and without thinking and muscle memory, I think, okay, I'm turning left. So I'm turning into the near lane mm -hmm. or I'm turning right. So I'm turning into the far lane. So I say that out loud so that I don't accidentally just, yeah. In I the roundabouts. Roundabouts. That way. You don't go this way. Yes. Go that way. Mm -hmm. That's... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's, but I don't, I mean, I would, I still do it and I would never trade any of the little villages oh that I've been to without doing it. So, I, I mean, I think it's doable. It takes a little bit of extra practice. But if you're worried when you rent a car, that's when the, um, like when I drive it, non-deductible insurance. So that little scratches with the bushes and so forth. Don't get nicked. So Yumiko, um, just mentioned car insurance and I hadn't brought that up because I knew somebody was going to ask a question. Oh, I love me some zero deductible <laughs> collision damage <laughs> waiver. The CDW, yep. it's going to cost me what, 25 to $30 extra per day. I don't care. I'll sleep in a cheaper hotel because that sweet peace of mind of, I want to be able to turn that car in, in a smoking heap of rubble and just be like, <laughs> Pay for the extra yep, insurance. Walk away. <laughs> it also gives you freedom um, when you're dropping off your car because you don't have to worry. You don't have to wait for somebody to inspect it. You don't have to, no. is anything going to show up? Is it a nighttime drop off where you just drop off the keys? You're just like, yeah, I'm, I'm out of here. So uh, let's see some other questions. Melody wants to know how do you make seat reservations with the URL pass? So with the new electronic URL passes, you have to do it on URL.com's website. Um, if it's, well, I guess I should rephrase that. It depends on the type of reservation it is, the type of train. So if it's a French high-speed train, a TGV train, TGV as they say, Eurostar between London and Paris, Talus between Paris, Brussels, and Amsterdam, those have more limited availability. So you'd want to do those through URL.com before you leave. Um, if it's a train in Spain or a train in Italy, you can do that at the station. Um, you would just show your pass um, and you could make it at the station if you had to. But I think with the new electronic passes, I haven't used one myself, so I'm not exactly sure all the nuances of how they work. But um, most all the reservations you have to do right on URL.com. Thank you, Rich. Uh, let's see. Oh, Patricia asks, does global entry really help? TSA pre-check. Oh, I think it does. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Especially global entry when you come home. Yep. Mm -hmm. That customs line. Last year at Chicago, I feel bad. Even for the U.S. passport holder, it was three hours. Yikes. Yeah. Global entry. Worth every penny. Although yeah. you can still get waved aside even with global mm -hmm. entry. They can say... You've been randomly selected yep. to go in the back room with your luggage. Or SSSS on that um, boarding pass. What does that mean? That means you're specifically randomly checked so that you're going to, even though if you have the global entry, before you get on the airplane, they will take you and they will do special extra checks of everything. Wow. You. Yep. Mm -hmm. I got like three in a row one time. Like, really? Oh, I'm sorry. I know. Mm. And it's very scary if you get that in Germany. <laughs> yep. Like, come this way. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even going <laughs> to probably insult all our German watchers. Um, Let's see. So um, John wanted to know, how can people navigate toll roads in France and other parts of Europe? Well, we, we talked about that, but I wanted to mention um, another specific resource for people and that is a website called via michelin.com and we put it in the links but that is a route planner from michelin the people who make the tires and make the maps um, and it will estimate your tolls and that's really helpful i think does any of those um rental car company rent you those Thingy. You can still rent a GPS for an extra like $12 a day. I just use my phone. 
Oh, um, no, no, the, the toll thingy. Oh, the toll thingy. Toll thingy. Um, I think in Portugal, you can get that with your rental car. Yep. You can somehow attach it to your license plate and it works, but... It's usually in the car itself, like on the windshield. Uh -huh. So when you pick up the rental car, it's just part of the rental car. And then it automatically tracks all the tolls for you when you drive through. So you get to go through that special lane. Okay, ladies, any tips on choosing between travel insurance options? Mm, just shop. Well, you need to be sure you're looking at apples to apples because, I mean, we, we deal with travel insurance a lot. Um, I, I've been in this business a long time and I've seen a lot and I've heard a lot and I've, you know, I've had clients that have had serious situations. Um, so I think the biggest thing is get a couple quotes. Um, I'm not an advocate of going on to, uh, there's some site like orange tomato insurance.com or something. I, it's some <laughs> wackadoodle name that like, and I've never heard, I've had people ask me about, I've never heard of any of them. Do not save $20 on your insurance. Um, I, I, the three names that come to mind to me would be travel, travel guard, mm -hmm. travel X mm -hmm. and uh, travel insured and is that what about alliance or alliance probably okay i mean the, the one people, these are my three lisa just yeah <laughs> well those the three that i gave you i think are three that i feel confident throwing their names out there mm -hmm. i know you work a lot with travel guard um we worked for years with travel x we're working now with travel insured so all three of those i think are reputable um, it's, again, it's apples to apples because they're not, not every policy is the same and there can be very big price differences, mm -hmm. but, um, I think the biggest thing is that people have some coverages now for medical, that you understand what your personal medical insurance will and will not cover. Um, and then, you know, with our this last year, for example, in 2022, we had more um, travelers filing claims for things that I don't think they ever anticipated when they bought insurance, such as delayed flights, canceled flights, hotel hotel rooms because their flights were canceled or delayed. Baggage? <laughs> last year was a nightmare for baggage. So lost baggage, delayed baggage. Um, most of these plans are very comprehensive. And I know if I'm traveling out of the country, I'm going with an insurance plan. Do you guys sell travel insurance? We do. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Um, last question, because I, I like these sort of old school questions. Margaret wants to know, is it possible to arrange a couple day layover anymore? Yes. I mean, you'll probably it's pay. Stopover. Yeah, it's a stopover. And and you're probably going to pay a little more to do that. But if you really want to go to Amsterdam on your way to Rome, well, why not? Uh, <laughs> so um, so it's just a little, we just do the tickets a little differently um, than if, so it's, it, it's more of a, what we call a stopover than a layover. A layover is when you're really connecting from one plane to another and there's rules around how long a layover can be before it's considered a stopover. So it's going to be a, it's usually what we call a stopover, very doable in many situations. Um, the other thing we may do is utilize a train and maybe somebody flies into Amsterdam and they really want to go to Paris. Um, we'll just take them down on the, on the train. Sure. And, and then they fly that. And then they can fly home from Paris. So, um, do you guys sell train tickets as well? Um, not a lot. Um, we work with Rail Europe. That's who we're going to sell train tickets through. Is Rail Europe because it's one complete, concise place. One stop shop. One stop shop, and you know we have so many moving parts in everything we do that. Okay. We have to know one thing and know it fairly well. Um, so if a train is is available to us and it's a fairly straightforward thing, we will do it. 
we're probably going to have an additional fee on top of Royal Europe's fee to process that uh, those tickets as uh, there's not really a compensation for us. It's more of a courtesy than a than a than something you normally do. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of courtesy, I want to thank you guys for taking the time to drive up here and be here for our viewers. Rich, you didn't have to come as far, but you took your time <laughs> to help um, help all our travelers learn all these things. I hope you guys found it really helpful. Um, and like I said, it was my dream to get a bunch of us around and talk about these kinds of transportation hacks. So I want to thank you all very much for joining us. And I hope that you can join us again next week when Julianne is going to be hosting Elena Zamperon from Venice, a native Venetian, and they're going to be together talking about Venice. So that's next week on Monday Night Travel. Thank you so much. You guys have a great evening. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.